Okay, WPIL Blitz Show, our week two edition or week one, not really sure uh, which one we're going at. All we know is that uh, I'm alongside uh, my best buddy here for the WPIL, Ian McMeans. Ian, welcome, and want you to introduce our very special guest here that we've got tonight. Yes, we're very honored to have uh, Coach Tim Boster, the head coach of the Woodland Hills Wolverines, on the show tonight. Uh, Woody High pulled off a victory over William Penn York in the Peach Bowl Showcase, one of the few Whitfield teams to actually beat a team from outside the district this week. So congratulations on the big win, Coach. And you know, how was it going out to Chambersburg and playing in the, the Peach Bowl Showcase against a highly talented team uh, from the eastern part of the state? You guys had to get a big stop at the end to win the game. Hi, Coach, you there? Yes, sir. Okay. okay uh, so how was the Peach Bowl Showcase experience for you and your team? Uh, it was good. Uh, Friday you know, afternoon, traveled up. Uh, stopped by Shippensburg University to do a quick walkthrough, and then you know, headed over to uh, watch the Bishop Canavan Stilton High Spire game. And, you know, that game was exciting. Came down to the wire and, you know, bunched up the kids after that. And, uh Headed back to the hotel where we had some meetings and, you know, woke up the next morning and had some more meetings and headed to Chambersburg to take on uh, the Bearcats. How beneficial to you is a trip like this for your team early on? I would guess this is a great way to develop camaraderie and chemistry for a new group of guys. Yeah, you know, you take a you take a group of you know. I think we traveled with fifty eight guys. You take a group of fifty eight guys out on the road, and you know, you put a you know three, four, maybe five of them in a hotel room together, and uh, you know, you get some bonding that's going to happen. And uh, you know, we we did a trip too this summer with the seven on seven, and we did something very similar to where we took the kids and uh, did an overnight trip down to the University of Maryland. You know, we tried to do one of those a year to get the kids to to bond together. So. Uh, you know, getting the kids out of their normal atmosphere and getting them together, you know, it's always a positive thing for them to get to know each other and to bond together as a family. Yeah, and, I mean, you guys, how do you prepare for a team like William Penn York who, you know, when you prepare for Whippeal opponents, you kind of, you know, see them fairly often, but when you face a team that, you know, you've never played before from a different part of the state or even last year you guys played a team from New Jersey, um, you know, how do you prepare for a team that you really haven't seen at all ever? Uh, you know, usually going into that, you know, as a head coach agreement, you exchange whatever it is, the last two games of the previous season. And then, you know, obviously you, you uh, exchange the scrimmage the week before. But, uh, you know, you, you got to do some delving and you got to understand, you know, who who does what, you know, going into it. You know, I knew Coach uh, Russ Turner because they came down to our place and played Central Catholic a couple years ago in our uh, classic down here. So, you know, got to meet Russ at that point. You know, he's a great guy, runs a great program. And, uh, you know, you get to meet their kids, and their kids aren't much different than our kids, you know. So, uh, you know, you knew what to expect. You knew it was going to be a hard, tough-nosed game. And, uh, you know, whenever you get a guy like Jaheim White, who's going to West Virginia, and, you know, uh, Sam Stoner, who's got a couple, you know, Division One offers to go with it, uh, you never know what you were quite going to get, but you knew that you were going to be in for a battle. Yeah, and a battle it was. It came down to the final play of the game where you had to make a stop on fourth down at the goal line. I mean, pretty incredible. Um, you know, it's obviously, since he knew Coach Stoner and whatever, what's that conversation like, you know, at the end of a game after such a hard-fought battle between two coaches as you're, you know, saying goodbye? Uh, you know, it's one of those ones that, you know, you told each other it was a great football game, exactly what we expected, keep their heads up. Uh, it was only the first game of the year. I told many of the kids going through the line the same thing, you know, keep your heads held high. You guys never gave up. It was a great game. And I uh, told Coach Stoner and a bunch of the kids I'll be following them. You know, it's sort of, I don't want to say got a fan, but, you know, definitely would love to see what they do here in the, in the year out there in the central part of the, the state. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a really great story. I mean, I think everybody, uh, and I'm a District 3 guy, I live here in Reading and cover York High and, uh, you know, York High and its resurgence and what Coach Stoner's done there has just been um, terrific. So, Ian, you have another question for Coach? I do, yeah. Um, so, what are your uh, what are your goals and expectations for your team this year? I know, you know, at Woodland Hills, the, the goals are always kind of championship or bust, but, um, you know, I've 
on our season preview show two weeks ago, I said that, you know, I thought Woodland Hills had the best junior class in the entire Whitfield, that you're, you're just absolutely stacked in that junior class. You have some fantastic players and um, you know, it's, it's going to be, I'm really excited to kind of see how they all grow and evolve over the next two years. But, you know, do you have any, any goals for this year? Uh, you know, our goal every week is uh, to go one and oh, so, you know, we always approach each week as we're zero and zero uh, go one and zero for the week. We kind of sort of stole that from Penn State and Coach Franklin, but it's a mentality that you have to have with the kids. They have to understand that you know, if you lost last week, this is a new week. Let's go one and zero. So, uh, you know, like I told them today, we can go one and zero as long as we can, and then at the end of it, you know, we all go back to zero and zero. So, uh, you know, just expectations here. Are always, I always tell the kids, you know, let's make the playoffs. Anything can happen once you get that. So, yeah, yeah, that's. Absolutely true, especially, I mean, there's been a couple of years that I can remember that, you know, Woodland Hills had a couple of losses in the regular season and still made it to the Whitfield championship game. It's always a, Woodland, I, I've always said, you know, Woodland Hills is one of the toughest outs in the playoffs that you're going to find regardless. It doesn't matter what the regular season record is, they're one of the toughest outs you're ever going to find in the playoffs. Yeah. And speaking uh, of. That one, what, I'm sorry. Speaking of tough outs, you've got gateway sorry, this week. Uh, uh, you've got Gateway this week, Coach. What do you expect out of them? Uh, you know, when you look at what they got coming back, the Brad Birch kid, you know, obviously all state two years in a row, great quarterback, has, you know, Oregon offer, has an offer from Akron, just a phenomenal quarterback. You know, they have some good speed. The Dallas Harper kid last week had eight catches for 108 yards and a couple touchdowns on top of an interception. Uh, Jaquan Reynolds kid's a very good kid. He's only going to be a junior tailback. So, you know, they got great skilled positions. And uh, Coach Hall does a great job of running that uh, screen pass option, as he calls it. Uh, you know, you got he tries to put one player in conflict. So you got to figure out who that player is and try to do the best that we can. So I have one last question for you, Coach. Um, you know, this was a realignment year in Pennsylvania and in the Whippeal in particular, um, you know, Woodland Hills has kind of bounced around between different conferences since we went to six classifications. You know, you played with the, the Southern schools, the, the upper St. Clair's, the, you know, Bethel parks of the world. You played with the, um, you know, the Eastern schools, the gateways, the Penn Trappers. Now you're up with the Northern schools, you know, the North Hills, the Pine Richland, the, the Penn Hills. Um, you know, do you like that kind of bouncing around seeing different conference opponents every couple of years, or would you prefer to kind of have, you know, one conference that you stuck with for a long time? Uh, I truly like the one conference for a long time, because what that does is that brings back a lot of your geographical, uh, you know, rivalries. Uh, you know, this year, honestly, we were supposed to, according to the numbers, we're a three, a school. We chose to play up to five, a, mm -hmm. uh, but that being said, that's part of the reason why, you know, you want to play your gateways, your Penn Hills, your Penn Traffords, you know, your Plums, all the schools are kind of close to you just because, A, it's a, a rivalry amongst the kids, but then also, B, you know, looking at it as a revenue-generating, you know, thing for the school. Um, as you get into it a little bit more, you know, attendance is down in WPI over the past couple of years with football games. Um, a lot of that is due to the live streaming and everything else of the game. So I feel that the more rivalries that you play with the closer proximity, the more fans probably put in the stands great answer great yeah answer. I, I definitely agree with that that was one of the things that i've kind of harped on ever since six classifications happened was that you lose a lot of those old geographic rivalries that you had with four classifications just because everyone's more spread out in you know different different classes different conferences all that stuff so yeah i, I definitely agree with you well listen coach thanks for your time tonight i tell you what uh uh, the work never ends for a high school football coach. And, uh, you know, these few minutes that we have had opportunity to meet with you, we really appreciate it. And, uh, look, I, I, I'm your newest, biggest fan after watching you guys play Saturday. I mean, I really love the game and, uh, best of luck the rest of the year. No problem. Appreciate it, Bruce. Thanks for having me. All right. Take care, coach. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot for coming on. We appreciate it. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. See you. Bye. Bye. All right, Ian. Well, I tell you okay. what, uh, Coach, uh, really uh, uh, appreciate him, uh, you know, stopping by and uh, uh, spending time with us here. And, 
and right. Woodland Hills has, has been, you know, a, a great success story on the football field that they were, um, you know, the, the history of their program being, you know, basically, uh, you know, a, a merger of a number of different schools um, that was, that happened, you know, in 1987 uh, or 86 into 87, but 87 was the first year that they played football. You know, you, you had your, your Braddocks, your Churchills, your Rankins, your, um, you know, Forest Hills, Turtle Creek, a bunch of different municipalities that all went to different schools, all having to get forced and merged in together to, to one school. Um, and then really it was a, a lot of, I mean, there was historically, you know, going back the first couple of years that the, the district had merged, there was a lot of violence, a lot of riots, a lot of just bad times within the schools. And it was really kind of, I mean, in my opinion, football that kind of brought them all together. I mean, they made the semifinals in their first season as a school. Um, they went to a Whippeal championship within their first decade in 1996. They won the Whippeal title in 96, um, you know, and then really, really took off from there into the <clears throat> 2000s, went to four straight Whippeal title games from 99 to 2002. And um, you know, have really, I think, you know, like coach said about, you know, getting these kids to go on trips together to, to bond and unify the team that, you know, we're still, you know, 35 years since the school merged, but um, you know, uh, there's still, you know, that's important to, to get kids from these different communities in together to build that familial relationship that, that builds you into a team. And that's where, you know, that's kind of where the magic happens is when you stop becoming individuals and become a team, um, you know, that's where, that's where it really, you know, the, the team comes together and you start self-sacrificing for the greater good of, of the team and the success of the team. And, and that's when you really start to see success on the field. I like what coach said about the rivalries. Okay. I mean, that's an important aspect of football that, you know, quite honestly, you know, I mean, as, as I, sit back here as a district three guy, you know, looking at the WPIAL um, in the case of uh, other than six, a, you really, I mean, you're reshuffling the deck just about, you know, every two years, and whether that's good or bad, like that's up to the schools to decide, you know, I mean, they're the ones that technically kind of run the WPIAL, but uh, I agree with coach. I, I, I think that it's a little bit tough when you don't have that cohesive group of rivals that, you can point at year on year, hey, our rival, you know, that one game, um, it, it it's very important. And uh, so anyway, uh, great conversation there. They have a really tough task this week against Gateway. But when you talked about those uniforms, now they were the road team. What yeah. those road uniforms of theirs are still pretty sharp. That's all. Oh, I they are. Say. They are. Yeah. And and really, I mean, the the other thing that I didn't mention in the interview, but you know. Coach Bostard had one of the toughest jobs in the world, which is following a legend. Uh, the guy that came before him at Woodland Hills, George Novak, had coached there from the time the school became a merged school, um, you know, up until 2017, and had amassed over 300 career victories, and you know, won multiple Whitfield titles. And then Coach Bostard, who was he played for Coach Novak and then was an assistant for him, kind of had to come in and become the head, you know, the guy that follows the legend is yeah. always one of the toughest jobs to have. Yeah. Um, and, and he's done a really good job uh, out there at Woodland Hills, you know, bringing the community together. And, um, and for our listeners who aren't from Western Pennsylvania, if you ever have a chance out here to go to the Wolverina and see a game, it is the best venue in yeah. Western Pennsylvania. It's a fantastic the parking is terrible, but the venue is amazing. The, the venue is incredible for, it, for so it's players. worth the wait, is what you're it saying. Because yeah, you're oh, gonna have to, yeah, it's gonna be a wait to get to the stadium from where you're parked. Yeah, yeah. You gotta find parking somewhere, but it's it's worth it. It's worth right. the visit. All right. Well, we'll definitely take you up on that. Uh, definitely after meeting the coaching staff and watching them and seeing the cool uniforms. Hey, I, I'm I'm all in. So yeah. Yeah. That the, the turquoise and black was a unique thing when they, when they brought it out in the eighties and it's still a unique thing. Um, you know, they've, they've made some slight tweaks to their uniforms with style and, and kind of like, like that, that Michigan the, Wolverine kind of helmet the, thing. Yep, I mean, the, wow. The, the Wolverine winged helmet has always been the same from 1987 till now. And uh, yeah, it's, it's one of the best uniforms in the Whitfield. It's just, it, you know, like I said, when, when you see that coming, it strikes fear and you just, it's, it's just one of those things. It just makes the look players uh, make the players look faster. 
<laughs> it does. It does. Well, and I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, I can remember when like Miles Sanders played for them and he looked yeah. fast and was fast. So, yeah, no, you know, I, long lineage of good players out there. They've, they've had some great ones. Yes, they have. All um, right. Actually, yeah. Rob Gronkowski played there for a year. His, That's his right. Exactly. Yeah. Was that, that was his last year. Like he moved down from, wasn't he? He was from like New York Buffalo, State, I think. Yeah. yeah he right. Moved down from moved Buffalo. Down. Yeah, yep, right, and right. Jason Taylor, Lasaka Polite. There's been a whole slew of guys wow. that have come through that Woodland Hills program. Um, wow. I think it, at one point in time, actually, Woodland Hills had the most current NFL players of any high school in the nation. Um, I don't that's think that's great. the case anymore. But wow. yeah, for there was a there was a period of time where Woodland Hills had the most NFL players of of any high school. That nation, is so. that's quite an accomplishment. See, yes. I mean, like I said, Mr. Whippeal aficionado himself. So, all right, man, you got control. Let's do this thing. All right, sounds good. So, yeah, so to answer your question at the very beginning of the show, what week is it? Is a great question because we had <laughs> week 0 this past week, but I hate that week 0 is a thing. It should just be week 1 because it's the first week where you can have games. Um but I understand why it is what it is because you have nine official weeks and you can have a week zero game or a scrimmage, but I think week zero is dumb. So this is, you know, we had the first week of games, but it was week zero. So um, as you know, if you're watching the show, you know where to find us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or all of my articles on steelcityblitz.com. Um, as we get into the season, we will have uh, preview articles for, um, you know, each week's best games and, uh, you know, we'll take a look at playoff races, playoff standings, all that stuff um, will yep. be forthcoming as we and look at this. here. I'm sporting the uh, performer of the week, the Brute Athletic performer of the week shirt. So yes, uh, thanks to Brute. And uh, so we'll be announcing that uh, during the course of the show here. I'll be wearing this every week. I think this is a, you know, great way to promote it here a little bit. So, yeah. Okay, so we'll talk about some key results from this week. So um, obviously we talked a lot about the Woodland Hills game, and that was a big one. Um, locally, I think two of the biggest wins, Connellsville uh, broke a 17-game losing streak by beating Albert Gallatin. Um, and 17 games may not sound like a lot, but let's not forget that two years ago, we only played a, a seven game season. So they hadn't actually won a game since 2019. Um, so this was their first win in like three years for the Connellsville program. So good for them getting off the schneid. It was the second longest losing streak in the Whippeal, um, one by three points over their Fayette County rivals, Albert Gallatin, and then Mars uh, edging out Montour. That's also noteworthy because as you'll recall, recall Mars's head coach is now Eric Kasparowicz who used to be at Pine Richland so um, coach Kasparowicz gets his first win at Mars uh, beating Montour who was a playoff team in 4A last year and um, as you'll recall Mars won like two games in 4A last year so now Mars already is starting to see the turnaround team, right? there uh, Mars they're, is four. A they're four they're four okay they're four yeah they they were five a couple cycles ago and then dropped down to four okay. they've kind of bounced back and forth between 4A and 5A um so I think they were four and then they were five and then they were four again. So okay. yeah, but they're, they're kind of right on the cusp. That's a, that's a, a growing suburban community. So they're, they're going to be, I mean, there's a lot more housing going in there. I was just driving through there actually <laughs> this weekend and there's all these new housing developments going in and it's uh, it's, it's kind of crazy how fast stuff's getting built out there. So that they'll probably be moving up soon just because of all the new housing that's being built. Um, the game of the week was actually the one that I attended, um, the Seneca Valley Penn Hills game. And, and as we said, you know, Seneca Valley is one of the best teams in 6A. Penn Hills is one of the best teams in 5A. Um, and, and the score is kind of indicative of how close the game was, but it was kind of a weird game how it played out in the first half. Penn Hills was kind of pinned back against their own goal line the whole game. It seemed like anytime they had a good offensive play, they'd take a penalty, couldn't really get anything going. Um, Seneca Valley was up 11, nothing at halftime on uh, a touchdown and a missed two point conversion, a field goal, and then a safety. So interesting way to get to 11. Um, but they, you know, they got there. Um, so it was 11, nothing at halftime. And then after halftime, Penn Hills, came out on offense and started moving the ball and the offense started clicking a little bit. They drove it down the field, kicked a field goal to cut it to 11 to three. And I'm kind of thinking like, all right, you know, it's, it's 11 to three. They're only eight points down. They've got a chance. And then you know, they got to stop and, and drove it back down. Actually uh, running back Amir key for Penn Hills had a 53 yard touchdown run to, um, you know, 
pull the game closer and they uh they missed the they had the extra point blocked um wow. so that made it 11 to 9 and then Penhill scored again actually key had another rushing touchdown this one's a little bit shorter um and then uh the they had the next extra point blocked. So it was 15 to 11, which was a wild score right at the beginning of the fourth quarter. Um, and then about halfway through the fourth, Seneca Valley drove it down their quarterback, Graham Hancock, who he throws a really nice ball. That kid's got a great arm. Um, but Hancock's was, was throwing it all over the yard, but did it himself, ran it in from four yards out um, for the go ahead points. And uh, Seneca Valley uh, missed the extra point. So we had some, some questionable kicking in this game. Um, you know, and so at 17, 15, Penn Hills gets the ball back, drive it down the field and have a 34 yard field goal for the win as time expires. And they, they pushed it wide. So, um, you know, wound up being a, a real, for as dominant as Seneca Valley was in the first half, wound up being a really exciting second half. And, you know, neither of those teams have anything to hang their heads about. Um, both of them played great defense. Uh, you know, once Penn Hills offense started clicking, um, you know, they were definitely a force to be reckoned with. So those are, those are two really good teams that can make really deep runs this year. Uh, my upset of the week was Westinghouse, a school out of the Pittsburgh City League, just absolutely throttling Clareton, um, which was a, a wild result. I mean, I thought Clareton was one of the best, you know, 1A teams. I mean, they are one of the best 1A teams around. Um, and Westinghouse out of the City League um, just put a thumping on them on Saturday afternoon. So Clareton's got a lot of good young players, but, you know, they've got, they've got, uh, you know, they've, they've got some work to do too. I, yeah, I just have one question here. Well, I'll raise my yeah. hand, you know, yes. from now on. I have a question, but <laughs> but this isn't school. You don't have to. That's a high I, school I, show. Well, but you don't no, have to raise your okay. hand. But look, so look, I mean, one of the things, and this is just something from the preview show, is the fact that you know you were talking during the preview show about how um, you know a lot of people really weren't giving Clareton a lot of credit, and um, so what do you think? You know, obviously they go through their conference or whatever like that. Is Westinghouse a much bigger school than Clareton? Because I don't know about the the you know the, the city league. Um, I think they might be two A or three A. Uh, let me. So I'll, it wasn't a mismatch there. So no, yeah, they're, so they're not may, massively bigger. Yeah. So you know, maybe maybe Clareton is down this year. Maybe or or it's, it's also possible on the flip side that. Um, the, the city league is up like the city mm -hmm. league, you know, could just be better. Um, Westinghouse is, is two a, by the way, I just looked okay. it up. Um, but the, you know, the, the city league actually, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, but the city league had some good results against Whippeal opponents, which is not how it's traditionally gone. Traditionally, the, the Whippeal is kind of dominated the city league anytime they've played. Uh, but the city league did pretty well this year. So okay. I think, I think it may be a combination of, you know, Clareton has some work to do, but Westinghouse has been a strong city league program the last couple of years. They've won a city league title. Um, actually, my one too, but they've, they've been strong. They've had a couple of D one athletes come through there. A couple of kids that went to, you know, division one schools. Um, and so I think, I think the city league is getting better. Um, so it's a surprise, but not, not like an incredible type of, type of upset i mean it's a surprise but it's not earth shattering is what you're saying yeah i i'd say it's it's a surprise um but i also yeah yeah it's it's surprising but not earth shattering it's not the end of the world for clareton i mean last year and these games zero, don't count okay right they, right they don't count and you know we won't go down that road again but <laughs> right right and and l last year in week zero clareton played steel valley and lost like 14 to 12 well, and everyone's ask... like oh steel valley was bad you know they, is clareton gonna be bad this year and then steel valley was had the whipfield's leading rusher wound up being the number one seed in 2a and you know clareton wound up being the top seed in 1a and it was just like oh no these those that was a really good team they played so yeah do these games count for district eight in, in like uh, power ranking points? I don't know. No, no, okay. um, because no district, uh, the city league doesn't do power rankings either. Okay. Um, they do like, they do this weird head to head standings thing and then have a, have a playoffs with the, cause there's only six teams in the Pittsburgh city league. Um, and well, and actually only five of them actually compete. Be, well, 
compete for the title because Carrick plays as like an independent, even though they're part of district eight. Um, so yeah. it's, <laughs> there's like five teams, they have a playoffs. Um, and then there's also some, some weird way that they qualify for the state playoffs because like, cause the city league has like Taylor Alderdice, which is a six, a school Brashears five, a Carrick is four, a, uh, university prep is 4A and then like Perry and Westinghouse are 2A. So you've got all these schools of different sizes that then play for the city league title. And somebody wins it, but then sometimes like, I think it's the team that wins the city league title. And if the team that loses it is from a different um, classification, then they can also qualify for the state playoffs. It's, it's really weird how it, how it works for the, how like they fit into the PIAA I, I'm, bracket. I'll be honest it's, with it. it's bizarre. All right. Uh, <laughs> it does sound bizarre. It is. That's why I follow the Whippeal and not the City League because it just doesn't, you know. And there's I'm only six an teams. So I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Much, much different than the, the Philadelphia City League. But at any rate, um, some other noteworthy results. So Moon, you know, was the top seed in 5A last year. Um, the last week of the season, they absolutely crushed West Allegheny, who was their rivals. West Allegheny dropped down to 4A this year and turned around and smoked Moon in week zero. So noteworthy for a rivalry victory and just how big of a change it was from last year. Now, as we said in our preview show, you know, Moon graduated like 23 kids from their team that went to the Whitfield title game. West Allegheny, even though they went down to 4A, uh, had a lot of underclassmen that played last year. So, um, you know, Moon's Moon's still working in some new starters, trying to figure things out. Apollo Ridge and Leechburg, um, two neighboring rivals that played in a really close game. Apollo Ridge is in 2A, Leechburg's in 1A, um, and, and Leechburg's a good, a good 1A team, so I'm not worried about them. Uh, Mount Lebanon also lost their opening game after winning the, the 6A state title last year, losing to Gateway 21-6. Um, my, my, about... pick, my dark horse yeah. pick for 5A in the Whippeal, yeah. by the way. I don't know how much of a dark horse it is. I mean, they're really good, but... Uh, oh, but... All right. How yeah, many but, people picking them though, right? No, no. I mean, I, 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 I had them as my number two team behind Penn Hills. So okay, yeah. all right. Um, but but yeah, I mean, Gateway's a really good team, and Gateway brought back a lot of starters. Um, you know, like Coach Boster talked about that. Um, that you know, they're they're a good team that has a lot of good returning starters, and Mount Lebanon kind of like moon had to work in a lot of new starters so i think mount lebanon will be fine once the the regular season rolls around penn trafford winning a a, a big game over cannon mcmillan um i think the final score wound up being a little closer than the game was cannon max scored two fourth quarter touchdowns to make it a little bit closer um but penn trafford's quarterback conlin green had a great game um four total touchdowns 300 35 passing yards i think it was um and he's a defensive line commit to temple so you know he's a he's a tough kid to bring down but also he's got a nice arm uh western beaver winning a rivalry game as we talked about the woodland hills victory on the last second goal line stand over william penn york so as we mentioned you know going outside the whip uh not the best week for, wow. for whip teams um they were six and eleven overall um you know, got a couple wins over the, some of those District 8 city, Pittsburgh City League schools that I mentioned. Uh, Avonworth did beat Grove City. So, you know, on our 3A, 2A, 1A preview show, I said that I hope the Penn Live guys who made the state rankings were paying attention because they had Grove City as their number 10 team and Avonworth in their honorable mentions. So I think those should flip this week. Uh, well, we're, uh, we're recording cool. the show Monday night. They'll come out tomorrow morning, so we'll see what they are. Um, but, you know, they, they, those should at least flip. Avonworth is pretty clearly better than Grove City. Um, Whitfield did well against the District 10 schools they played. Um, and, but, you know, some of the other ones, Bishop Canavan lost to Steel High, um, Canton beat Union, which that was, I, I got to give a shout out here. That nice little story here. Um, so Mohawk is a Whippeal school is under investigation for a hazing incident. They had to cancel their game against Union on like Tuesday or Wednesday of last week, I think it was. So Union was without an opponent. Um, Canton out of District 4, who's one of the top 10 ranked teams in the state um, in single A, uh, was was looking for an opponent and you know wound up hooking up with union and you know i i did kind of message the coach the canton coach on twitter because i saw that he was looking i was like hey union's free if you want to you know i didn't wow. have any contact info for him but i i like to think i played a small part but even if i didn't it's really cool they got together and played um but the other cool thing was that union uh which is a lawrence county school up by newcastle 
um, pretty close to Mohawk, actually only a couple of miles away, but Union offered to let Mohawk's band come and play at halftime um, since they weren't going to get to play at the game because Mohawk had to cancel. And since the band wasn't involved in the, you know, hazing incident that the football team was involved with, it was a really, really nice gesture by Union to let. Uh, well, the, the speaking of nice gestures, I mean, one of the one of the teams that's stepping up in the same capacity is still high with Middletown. Uh, they've let the cheerleaders, they've let the band. Uh, there's been a player transfer uh, to Steel High from, you know, Middletown. So Steel High in the same way is helping out, like I said, the band and the cheerleaders. They've been mm-hmm. welcomed with open arms uh, from the Middletown there with their season canceled. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And Mohawk has not made a determination yet. They they canceled their game this week. Um but the against Quaker Valley, but they've not determined what they're going to do with their season while the investigation is ongoing. So we'll see. Um, and then the, the one other note I had here was, uh, you know, the, the Whippeal got swept out by teams from out of state. So everyone, everyone, the Whippeal teams played from out of state. Now, granted, like San Edwards, Ohio was like one of the, I think, they were ranked like 13th in the nation. They were the top ranked team in Ohio, but you know, central Catholic had designs on the, you know, Whitfield state, state, championship. The, the state championship. So, you know, it, it was, a, it was a great matchup. I'm glad they played, you know, that, that Pickerington North team for Ohio is a good team that Pine Richland lost to. Um, so, you know, Millville, New Jersey, I think was one, one of their state titles last year or came pretty close. So, you know, good teams that the Whitfield teams played, they just didn't win any of the games and, and really weren't, close in a lot of them either so yeah uh not, I, not the and, best season opening week and st joe prep out east they lost now granted you know st thomas aquinas is always you know top five top ten in the country um i mean it was a competitive game but they lost too so pennsylvania i mean oh man we had a, we had a rough go of it against out-of-state teams last week yeah yeah Although I will say, you know, that is kind of the nice thing about week zero is that you can schedule these games against out-of-state teams and, you know, kind of test yourself and see see how you do. So, you know, we could spend a whole show on, you know, like testing or whatever like that. You want like opponents, okay? Mm-hmm. That's really what tests you. If, if you. if you shoot too high, that's just like we, we talked about the fact that, you know, when, when the Peach Bowl Classic or whatever it was called out west here, there were so many Eastern teams that came out and just got shellacked by the WPIAL teams. I mean, they're just coming out for a trip rather than really a true test. And maybe some of these teams have to relook the fact that, you know, maybe we really need to schedule somebody that, that's more like us or that's going to be a, a beneficial opponent in setting us up for the rest of the season. Yeah. Although the other, the other side of it is, you know, sometimes you never know how a team will be. Like I remember a few years ago, like right after Pine Richland won the state title, not the, not the one, the first year we did our show, but the one they won before when they, that. When they placed IMG. I mean, yeah, they, they scheduled IMG Academy when they scheduled IMG Academy. That was, the, that was Phil Dracovic, who's at Boston college now was the quarterback of the Pine Richland team got, that won the won that out. state title. Well, Phil Phil graduated. So oh, like okay. that whole that whole class graduated yeah. and Pine Richland had to start a bunch of like sophomores and juniors against an IMG team and, that had like, you know, double digit players go to the NFL. So it's it's just like, you know, when you schedule this game, you're like, "Oh yeah, we won the state title this year. Come play us." But it's like, "Yeah, but all those kids graduated." So it's it's a different team year to year that you play you know so yeah correct all right (laughs) moving on (laughs) Uh, our player of the week presented by brute athletic nehemiah azim from olsh um led the whippeal in week zero with 445 passing yards five touchdowns um this kid just had an outstanding game he played on saturday afternoon um and olsh beat shenango who um Shenango was made the one a playoffs last year. So they weren't like a a walkover. Actually, they made the quarterfinals. They won their opening round game. So it wasn't, it wasn't a walkover opponent. Um, I I think the final score was like 32 to 12 or something like that. So it was, um, you know, not a walkover opponent, um, but Azim just had a great game throwing the ball all over the yard, five passing touchdowns, incredible performance. Um, so congratulations to Nehemiah. Yeah, congratulations. The, he'll, he'll get a, a replica shirt. I mean, I'm not going to give him the shirt off my back. I mean, they're <laughs> got another shirt that he's going to get, but these are pretty cool. I mean, and it's all the sublimated, 
here look at there even got like the wpil blitz logo you know nice. on there nice. so ssp network and okay. brute, a brute little logo there so all right good Excellent. stuff i'll yeah. be wearing this every week so cool cool all right so some other top performers from week zero we had a lot of them. I already talked about Conlon Green from Penn Trafford, Caden Olson from Armstrong. Um, he won the Whippeal passing title two years ago and was the runner up last year. Um, got off to a great start, 273 yards, five passing touchdowns and a rushing touchdown. So Olson actually had the most touchdowns of anyone this week was six, which is just incredible. Um, and, and pretty much everyone else on this list had five. Uh, Matt Sieg, wow. quarterback from Fort Cherry, three passing touchdowns, two rushing touchdowns. Joey Mayer, the quarterback from Hampton, had four passing touchdowns and a rushing touchdown. And then Robert Fulton from Latrobe had five rushing touchdowns and their big win over neighboring rival Derry. Um, you know, there was, there was a lot of good, as I was going through the list of stats, like you know, there were guys who had three receiving touchdowns, which in and of itself is a great game. Like three receiving touchdowns in a game is great. Um, you know, some other guys had four Rodney Gallagher from Laurel Highlands had five touchdowns um, in a variety of ways. I think one on defense, touchdown. a couple on offense and, you know, but it was, yeah, it, it's uh yeah, it was it was a big week for scoring in the WPIL. So congratulations to all of our top performers and to Nehemiah Azim, our, our player of the week. Also want to give a shout out to some head coaches that got their first wins uh, at new programs. Um, some wow. of them are first time head coaches. Some of good, them are good stuff. Um, Ian. Yeah, some of them are, uh, you know, coaches who have coached before just at different schools, but this is their first win at that school. Um, for example, Eric Kasparowitz at Mars and Stacy Robinson at Newcastle, who we interviewed last year on the show when he was a coach at Union. Um, now moving up from 1A Union to 4A Newcastle, um, Stacy Robinson is a Lawrence County Hall of Famer. So you know, Newcastle getting a, a Hall of Fame coach, um, you know, defeating Summit Academy this week, and um, you know, a lot of a lot of good things happening around the WPIL. There was actually 34 new coaches this season or schools with new coaches i should say because they're not all first time head coaches but 34 schools with new coaches this season so um you know 11 of them got victories this week and like i said shout out to the connellsville guys um that's an interesting situation there where they have three co-head coaches that were appointed so maybe wow. we'll get to talk to them sometime this year um, and just see see how that arrangement works out right i mean i've never heard I of like three co-head coaches before so i'm fascinated like to know how it works it sounds like something out of a monty, monty python sketch you know they act as a sort of supreme executive officer of the week and decisions of that officer have to be ratified and a special you know meeting that the three coaches have on the sidelines prior to the play i mean i'm 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 fascinated to know how it works i would love to talk I to those too. guys it would be I great Okay, what we so need to do is get all three on and <laughs> that would be that would be that would be awesome to have that all three on and just see how it goes yeah <laughs> so congratulations to to all these guys on getting their first victories as, as head coaches at their respective schools uh, so our streak watch um we saw the number two teams on both boards go down so mount lebanon's 15 game losing streak came to an end and connellsville seven or sorry Mount lebanon's 15 game winning streak came mm -hmm. to an end connellsville 17 game losing streak came to an end um, everyone else, well, Aliquippa didn't play a game this week. They had a scrimmage. Uh, also of note, the Whippeal champs uh, didn't do so well kicking off the season. You know, Central Valley and Penn Trafford won, and Aliquippa played a scrimmage. So they didn't have a result, but Mount Lebanon lost. Sarah Catholic lost to North Catholic. Now, also remember the Sarah Catholic playing North Catholic. Like, that's a 2A school playing a 4A school. So, you know. Um, and it doesn't count. Up a little bit. Right. It counts towards their overall record, but it doesn't count towards making the playoffs. So, so they will be 0 and 1 overall, but not, not a conference game. And then Bishop Canavan lost to Steel High. Um, as far as active losing streaks, um, Elwood City did lose to Brentwood. Um, so their longest losing streak continues. And other, also noteworthy that Brownsville, um, who had a 20 game losing streak, uh, at the end of last season, then opted to play an independent schedule, did lose to Bentworth. Um, so Brownsville has now lost 21 straight games. Our recruiting update of the week, which is uh, also presented by Get Recruiting or Get Recruited. Um, Jason Cross, the quarterback slash defensive back from Bishop Canavan, um, got offered by Akron. So congratulations to Jason on his Akron offer. And Bruce, I'll let you talk a little bit about what Get Recruited can do since they are the uh, presenter of our recruiting update i tell you what get recruited is doing a great job in uh 
getting kids noticed uh, free. Okay, no obligation here. Uh, go to getrecruitedconsulting.com. It is a great resource to show everything that Get Recruited is doing uh, for athletes. Uh, there are free evaluations done for film. Uh, phone calls are set up with the student athlete and then the parents from Andrew Cohen himself. They have a series of webinars, not only about recruiting, but also in how to, in fact, the next one coming up is like how to help your 40 time. Get Recruited is partnering with not only uh, the schools, but also all these training partners that are working with uh, athletes as well to get those measurables in, in, the, in the lane that schools will take a look at them. So all I can say, getrecruitedconsulting.com. If you're a high school athlete looking to play at the next level for football, you just got to take a look at this website. Take advantage of all the free tools at your disposal to get you to the next level. Okay. All right. Great. And thanks to Andrew Cohen and Get Recruited for their support of our show. All right. So, uh, you know, moving forward a little bit, we're going to talk about some week one games that are coming up. So just as a reminder, uh, oops, this should say 2022 scheduling format. I copied this slide from last year's show. And uh -oh. uh, <laughs> so this should be 2022 at the top. So just ignore that. There's Pay so no much... attention to the man behind the curtain. Um... <laughs> so much data in this, uh, yeah, in, in this show. Like I said, I mean, this is the show for the football geeks in Pennsylvania. Yes. So we're moving out of week zero into week one. Um, so one note is that uh, there is one conference game happening in week one. Um, it is in six A, um, and everyone else plays a non-conference game that is scheduled by the WPIL. Next week we'll have some conference games that start in five A as well. Um, and then as we move into the season, more and more conference games will happen until we hit week five, about the midpoint when all teams will be playing uh, conference games, which are the ones that count towards making the playoffs. So our week one games of the week, we've got a lot of them. A lot of them are you know, rivalry games and, and you know, neighboring school wow. districts, neighboring communities. So the one in bold is the one uh, conference game of the week, the one that matters towards making the playoffs, North Allegheny taking on Cannon McMillan. Um, and this is kind of a big one um, because last year, if you'll recall, um, Cannon McMillan and North Allegheny played in the 4-5 the play-in game um, to you know, make the semifinals in 6A. And this year with only five teams in 6A, only four of them are going to make the playoffs. So, um, you know, North Allegheny was the fourth place team last year. Cannon Mac was the fifth place team. Um, you know, obviously things change from year to year, but um, this is kind of an important game for, you know, the, the playoff standings as they will be at the end of the year in, in 6A because there are so few teams competing for those spots that, you know, with five teams, you're only going to get four conference games um, to, to figure out who makes those, those four playoff spots. So that is a big one uh, in, in 6A. Um, some other ones to talk about, Bethel Park at Mount Lebanon. Um, you know, Bethel Park's a, a strong 5A program, got off to a, a good start with a win last week over North Hills, taking on a Mount Lebanon team coming off that loss to Gateway. So this is kind of a good measuring stick game for Mount Lebanon to kind of see where they are. Woodland Hills and Gateway, um, two 5A squads going at it that were conference opponents the last two years. But now that Woodland Hills has been kind of moved up with the, the northern teams, they're not conference opponents anymore, but are able to have this game on the schedule as, as neighboring rivals um, should be a good one. Uh, Woodland Hills and Gateway both coming off week zero victories. McKeesport taking on Penn Trafford. Uh, McKeesport, a 4A program, but one of, one of my favorite 4A programs of, of, for the year. You know, I had them have them as my number two or actually number three, number three program in 4A. Um, you know, but I, I think they're, they're really good. Um, and Penn Trafford coming off the, the state championship last year in 5A, um, you know, should be a, a really good, really good matchup out there between two schools that, you know, back when we had six, back when we had four classifications used to be, you know, quad A rivals um, play each other all the time. So good to see them playing each other. South Fayette and West Allegheny neighboring communities, um, you know, in Southwestern Allegheny County, um, both of them coming off victories uh, in week zero. So be interesting to see how they kind of, you know, uh, flesh out against each other. They played in the conference together the last two years in 5A, but West Allegheny moved down to 4A this year. Aliquippa against Armstrong um, could be potentially a preview of a, a maybe quarterfinal playoff game. Um, Aliquippa 
has, you know, arguably the, you know, they're the defending four A state champs. What can you say about them? They are arguably the most complete team around. Um, Armstrong with Caden Olson is is the, you know, one of the Whipple leading passers potentially. Uh, should be a really good game with Armstrong's mm-hmm. offense going up against Aliquippa's defense. Aliquippa's got some some dudes on that defense in the secondary with Donovan Walker and Nate Lindsay and Cam Lindsay and all the guys on their line. And they Aliquippa is so good. And, and just you know, to see Olson against that defense is going to be is going to be something <laughs> interesting. Um, Avonworth against Central Valley. Yeah. Uh, Central Valley moved up to 4A this year. Should be one of the top 4A programs. Avonworth still in 3A. They were conference opponents the last few years. Yeah. Um, Avonworth, one of the favorites in 3A, should be a good one. And a, a nice little measuring stick game here. Laurel Highlands, um, you know, who we talk about four in 4A, there's there's four programs that are head and shoulders above everyone else, right? There's Aliquippa, there's Central Valley, there's McKeesport, and there's Thomas Jefferson. But who's the fifth best program in 4A could, I mean, it's kind of up for debate. Could be Armstrong, could be North Catholic, could be Laurel Highlands. Um, Laurel Highlands with Rodney Gallagher, who's going to West Virginia, um, you know, put a big whooping on Uniontown this weekend, this past weekend, and now plays a Bell Vernon team who used to be in their conference forever, uh, but Bell Vernon's now moved down to 3A. um, So it should be a a good measuring stick game for a Laurel Highlands team just to see how they kind of continue to match up against Bell Vernon. Um, Then as we move over to the other half, um, getting into some of the games of smaller programs, this top one's an absolute treat. Yeah, I mean, I was gonna these say, are, man, this, is, this is... is my predicted like 2A championship and game. This game doesn't Valley count, huh? Still rocks. No, not towards making the playoffs. It counts towards your record, but not towards making the playoffs. Right. But I'm, I mean, it's that's really uh, all that matters is making the postseason. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But uh, one thing where it could matter is, you know, later in the year when the Whipple committee is deciding on the seeding if both Steel Valley and Stowe Rocks win their conference, they could say, okay, who won this week one game and, and seed them higher in the playoff bracket. Um, so that, that okay. could come into play. Um, Washington and Clareton. Washington's a very strong 2A program. Clareton trying to get back on the right track after yeah. getting thumped by Westinghouse. I think um, it- but, but I'll say this too. Clareton and Washington have played each other uh, quite a bit over the last five years, and Washington's beat up on Clareton a lot, wow. um, being, a, being a bigger school, right? Um, being a 2A school versus a 1A school. Um, but that hasn't really deterred Clareton from having good regular seasons either. So Clareton's lost to Washington and we've gone on to have great regular seasons before. So I wouldn't read too much into the result in this game, but you know, Clareton's looking to get back on the right track after you know getting thumped by Westinghouse. Um, Laurel and Neshanik, two schools from uh, up in Lawrence County, up by Newcastle. Um, you know, both of them had big week zero victories. So kind of continuing to see how that plays out. They were conference opponents last year, but Laurel moved down to one a, um, so pretty, pretty big rivalry, especially between the student sections and, and all that. There's a lot of trash talking on Twitter and, and rivalries in all sports. So, you know, baseball, basketball, football, ev- everything, you know, strong rivalry between those two schools. Ocean Rochester, um, you know, two of the other top programs in 1A taking on each other. Um, they were conference opponents last year, but with 1A adding the additional conference this year, um, now they're in separate conferences. And then Greensburg Central Catholic at Bishop Canavan, another one that they were conference opponents last year in the Eastern Conference in 1A, but uh, are separated now because of the additional conference being added and Bishop Canavan moving over to the Black Hills Conference, which is you know a little more geographically beneficial for Bishop Canavan. So, uh, but you know, Greensburg Central Catholic is a, a really, really strong program. So it'll be interesting to see how that one plays out on Saturday afternoon. Great. Yeah. That's a great lineup of games. It is. It really is. And then the one other thing I, I, one thing I love. So if you follow me on Twitter, you'll know I love stadium, either brand new stadiums or people that installed new turf. I will retweet anyone that sends me a picture of like new <laughs> turf being installed or anything like that. Well, South well see, Alleghenia, we need to get an advertiser with like AstroTurf or one of these turf field manufacturers. <laughs> we should, we should, because I, I love it when teams, you know, shout out to Farrell up in district 10, who's, um, whose coach we interviewed last year, um, they're installing turf this year and it looks great as opposed to when there used to be uh, grass up, you know, up in Farrell. And, and I mean, they've got some athletes up there. They've got some dudes. I can't imagine how fast they're going to be on turf now. Um, yeah. So uh, South Allegheny uh, had played in uh, war Memorial stadium in Glassport forever. Um, you know, it was built in 1950. It was all concrete. And, I remember 
we played a game there when I was in high school in the early 2000s and the place was kind of a dump. Um, and I can't imagine 20 years later when it was 70 years old, how bad it was. It was, it was in bad shape, but South Allegheny went and built a brand new whole stadium, um, you know, turf field, all the amenities. So, you know, it's, it's, they're opening it this week against Freeport. Um, you know, so congratulations to the Glassport and South Allegheny community on getting a new stadium for not only the football team, but, you know, track and everything else. Um, so it's, it, it, it looks great. You know, I saw these pictures on Facebook um, from their boosters page uh, and it's just, it, you know, I, I love it when teams install new turf or new stadium. So shout out to South Allegheny. Can't wait to see how things look on the new turf. Good stuff there. All right. So that's all we've got for this week. Um, wow. And thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, we really appreciate you watching, you know, liking our videos on YouTube, uh, retweets on Twitter, um, shares on Facebook, all that good stuff. So we'll have a lot more as we get into the regular season and things go on. Um, you know, week zero is in the books. The season is off and running and uh, we're excited to see where it goes from here. Well, congratulations to our uh, Brute Athletic uh, Player of the Week. Uh, and uh, I tell you what, great work again, Ian. I tell you what, uh, I'm really start. I mean, the table is really set for this week on some really incredible games. That was the thing that I saw picked out from the uh, you know the presentation here from the from the show. And uh, yeah, I mean, storylines are already developing even before you, you know get to uh, you know conference play, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and really, I mean, you know, don't forget from here on out, the Whippeal has scheduled all the games. So a lot of credit goes to the Whippeal for scheduling a lot of these great games, you know, in week one of the season. Um, I, I think they've, they've definitely made some improvements over the last few years in how they schedule non-conference games. So credit where it's due to the WPIL for scheduling some really good games. Well, look, when the games don't matter, it's easy to schedule the game. What makes it difficult are scheduling good, tough, non-conference opponents. If it all then equates to a power ranking, which ultimately then determines whether you do make the postseason. So you're talking about games that don't count versus games that do count. And like I said, I, I'm not trying to, uh, not that uh, I, I'm trying to take a, uh, uh, you know, the wrong, uh, you know, approach with the Whippeal and their preseason or whatever like that. But what they have done is they've shortened it. I mean, I give them credit is that some conference play starts, you said, next week. So good for that. Uh, I'm really happy to see uh, that they do have some great games, very entertaining games, which is what they are. They're entertaining and uh, they're, they're preseason games for the, uh, for yeah, the and- uh, ultimate prize. And I think the other thing they did with these non-conference games, preseason games, whatever you want to call them, I'll call them non-conference games. What they did with these non-conference games is mitigated some of the mess that was caused by six classifications, right? Mm -hmm. That you can have Woodland Hills play gateway now that, you know, like coach talked about. Traditional, basically traditional rivals. You can can still play your, right. You can still play your traditional rivals even though you're not in the same classification or might not be in the same conference anymore, um, you know, just because of how the conferences had to be aligned. Um, you know, I was, I was a big critic of how the WPIAL scheduled non-conference games, um, you know, through, through the mid to late 2000s. Um, but over the last four or five years, they've, they've made some dramatic improvements, I think. And, and one of the things they've done is they've started – actually manually selecting them so how they had done it before for a while was they had like a computer program that made the schedule for them but the problem was what the computer program did was it worked alphabetically so you know let's let's take single a for example right we'll take single a so let's say you have you know your your i'll I'll make numbers up because why not let's say you have you know nine teams per conference with four conferences okay so everyone's gonna have one week where they're not playing conference opponents it's an odd number of teams and the other eight teams will play each other right so the first alphabetically first team gets one schedule alphabetically second team gets a second schedule so on and so forth seems fine until 
the alphabetically first team then has a bye week or, or a non-conference week the same week as another alphabetically first team so the computer's like okay we're just going to match those up so what wound up happening was you'd get like clareton who was awesome uh, like this is like the tyler boyd years right so this is like 2013 mm-hmm. 2015 right so you'd have clareton who is on like a 60 some game winning streak playing the alphabetically first team from another conference, which was like Avella, who had had to play a cheerleader the year before because they didn't have enough players to field a healthy team who had like, you know, 15 healthy players and had lost like 30 straight games in a non-conference game. And Avella would, would forfeit that game. So like you had, you had teams forfeiting games because this computer was scheduling them against dramatically different, even though they were both 1A schools, like no one in their right mind would schedule Clareton and Avella in a non-conference game if you would actually be picking it. Well, and because why. they're like an hour and a half away from each other. So it made no sense to do it that way. So once they started kind of manually doing it, being like, okay, who we're going to put Clareton against like, Washington and it was a two way school, but still, you know, geographically a little bit closer. So, you know, trying to, trying to make these matchups of teams that are geographically a little closer and well, from a, like a quality standpoint, exactly. Like I said, like competition, trying to schedule more games of like competition, um, which is something they've really tried to do, which produces some of these, these really good, you know, week one, week two games that we've got on the schedule. Look, that that's, what's great is the fact that the games are good. OK, and the reason that they're good is because they don't matter, because it, it, if it were if it was a coaches and an, a coach and an athletic director who ultimately had to make a determination of whether they were or won't going to make the postseason based on their non-conference schedule, they probably not play play as tough a schedule or the schedule that they've got. Like Woodland Hills, their first three games were in the road. I mean. Yeah. Now, part of that was, you know, they probably took a home game that they would have played and went up and played in the Peach Bowl Classic. But I don't think anybody would, uh, you know, go ahead and schedule like three road games to start a season. In fact, only have four home games the entire year. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I mean, it is what it is. I mean, that's what makes it fun to talk about the WPIL because there are so many things to talk about. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's so many different storylines happening throughout, you know, all the classifications. And sometimes you get those stories like, say, Ambridge last year, right? Like Ambridge came into the year having lost like 25 straight games. They won three games and wound up making the playoffs. They lost. But still, like, you know, sometimes you get that. It's like, when is a three and nine season a resounding success? Well, when you had lost 20 some straight games. And, uh, and that's the other that's the other thing I think that the Whitfield has done well is with some of these games scheduling these teams that are on these long losing streaks with kind of like opponents or even lower classification opponents to try and break some of these up and like let teams kind of have some success. Like, you know, yeah. it's a little tougher with the conference schedule. Cause if you've lost 29 straight conference games, then you, you got to go beat a conference stop, opponent at yeah, some point. Right. Yeah. But with the, with the overall losing streaks, like remember last year, um, you know, Northgate in week zero, we interviewed their head coach. They, they snapped a 32 game losing streak. I think it was um, with a week zero win. And then the next week, uh, another team snapped a losing streak. So when you have these games that the Whippeal is able to schedule, um, especially when you have like a, you know, maybe a three, a or a four, a school that hasn't won games in a long time, then, you know, maybe they're able to get, get games against teams that are, you know, slightly, slightly lower in classification sure. or um, more, more like opponents, as you said. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, it's always a blast. Thanks so much for your time. I mean, incredible statistics week in, week out. This is the show for all the football game geeks in the state. We're glad that not only our fans in the Whippeal watch, but all the fans that we're kind of getting across the state is uh pretty incredible because it does enlighten a lot of people on what the WPIL is all about and uh, get people uh, at least starting to look at at least of the top teams down the road. I mean, yep. uh, get some idea of who, of, of who, of what that freight train is. that's going to plow into them in the postseason. So. <laughs> and, anyway. and some of these classifications have three or four freight trains that anyone could make it through. So yeah. yeah. And, and when it comes with a PIAA, only one gets in. So, all right. Listen, Ian, thank you so much. All right. Yes. Thank you. Thanks to everyone who watched and follow us on Twitter, Facebook, all that good stuff. And we'll see you all next week. All right. Take care now.